we had, don't laugh at this because it's very serious to the person, and if you're an animal lover, you'll, you'll understand how serious it is. But someone was having a, a rather severe problem with their pet, they have an older dog, and they got terrible news. And the gentleman was so stricken with emotion, because this is his friend, it's his family, it's, it's who and the only thing he lives with, this puppy. It's everything to him. It's his companion, his buddy, his friend, his family member, really. And to lose this would be devastating. And I'm told he's a wonderful man, a compassionate man. And he asked for prayer. And we had certain people down there praying, much to everyone's glee. The animal took a turn for the miracle best, whatever it was, is gone and the, the animal is on his way home and well and strengthened. And that church created a miracle that, listen, they went for it and they got it. Today I'd like to discuss, yeah, why not? Yeah. Today I'd like to discuss with you a teaching that I hope you have an open ear gate. I hope you understand. One of the frustrating things for a minister after they're at this for any length of time, as we've discussed a number of times, is to see one side of the people get blessed and another part of Christian society remain the same. To see the move of God so real, vibrant, and manifesting in so many lives, and yet to see another part of the Christian family continue to suffer or be in stress with little change, if any, apparent to the eye. So the quest would be how, what is the explanation to see bounty and blessings here and virtually nothing here? What, God, the key, the explanation, please. And we believe by the grace of God and only by that grace that we have some sort of understanding of this by the grace of God. There are many teachings in the Bible that make it rather evident, but none, I think, or few so clear and eloquent and easy to understand as the book of Isaiah chapter 58. Now, if I might review, because this is so important, we may spend a week or two on this, because it ends with a secret and I should tell you that from the beginning, but it would be more difficult to understand. And as I said, the quest is to get everyone to see, everyone to understand that God is not a respecter of persons. And when you see someone mightily blessed, you can say to God, I want that as well and do it for me. And you have every right to do so. So this is to give us the key that how to, to get God to truly, truly bless you, your loved ones, your friends, for you to see the distinguished favor, the peculiar aspect of the move of God in your life that no one can deny, that no one can attribute it to luck or coincidence, but so real, so powerful, so absolutely obvious that it actually saves people because they want your blessing. Isaiah 58 begins, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. We could spend a week on that. God is saying, make sure when you deliver this message that you make it clear. Yell it, scream it, teach it, make sure it's a foundational truth. You cannot just pass over this message. You have to really be resolute clear, powerful, make them understand. Do not allow for this to be glossed over in any capacity. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, make sure it's heard and understood. And I could go on explaining with metaphor analogies for, for days about how important God is saying this particular set of instructions how urgent it is for people to get it. 
and show them the problem. Show my people, forget the world, it's my people that have got to get this right. Because if they don't, they won't be that testimony. They'll live in their neighborhood like everybody else. And my purpose will be extinguished because I need them to rise, I need them to be a light, I need for them to be seen, and for people then to inquire and say, good Lord, drag me to church, but I gotta have what you have for your children or your wife or husband. So show them what the problem is, and show Jacob, the entire house, the church, what their sin is. Imagine, God is not doing this to say you, you're an alcoholic, you, you swining little hypocritical liar. That's not the point. Wait till you see the end of this. He's trying to show you, I'm trying to make you prosperous and I'm trying to show you why you're not so that you can adjust and I can open up heaven and rain a Tehran of blessings upon your head. That's what this is. It's redemptive, not punitive. Now he begins to explain something that to the untrained ear, it passes too quickly. So bear with me. So now he begins to show them their sins. And he said, listen to how wonderful these people are. He's not being sarcastic. Absolutely not. He is saying, they seek me daily and they delight to know my ways. He's saying, man, these people are good. They actually look for me every single day. They're good Christians. They, they, they delight to come to church. It's not a drag. These people look, are looking for me. They wake up in the morning and go, God, this is the day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. Father, bless my walk to church. Bless my work. Father, don't let me go anywhere without you. They love God. They really do. Again, he is not being frivolous. This is not sarcasm at all. They delight to know my ways. Few people, God is very critical of people that don't delight to know him. And he's saying they delight. This isn't a burden to come to church. Some people come to church, spend all day. We go home at one o'clock, they're still here. They come four, five, six, seven days a week. They travel, they delight to know his ways. Remember, it began by saying show my people their sins, but right now he's telling them how good they are. Oh, my Lord, listen to this. And as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. These people try to follow the Ten Commandments. They have righteous people in Christ. They have the righteousness of Jesus over them. They're forgiven, they're pardoned. These people are good Christians. Good Lord. He's blessing them, praising them. This is an amazing moment. And again, we could stay there for days. They even keep the ordinances of God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They, God, should I take that job or this? If God says no, it's no. God, should I purchase that automobile or this one? Even if I want the red one, God says blue, I'm buying blue. Just tell me what to do, God. I want to follow your instruction. I want to obey you. These are absolutely wonderful Christians. I mean it, and he certainly means it. Listen to this. They then, repeating it, he's repeating it. They take delight in approaching God. They want to praise and what they run to the altar they to pray is not a burden oh god i thank you for giving me these 15 minutes thank you father they delight in reading oh psalm 91 my god thank you i read my few chapters today i feel inspired i, I I'm, I'm levitating i go to pray i hear the band and the worshipers sing and i'm overwhelmed I, they delight in approaching God. If you read that, you are absolutely getting a description of the very best Christians available to the Lord. But it began with, show my people their transgressions. Show the house of Jacob their sins. 
So after they hear this description and explanation, in, in such clear terms, in the original language, this would blow your mind. You'd walk on air. You're so blessed. Some of the roots of these words could go on with another root to it and another root to it, compounding roots. And you're, holy mackerel, that's what God thinks of me? This is unbelievable. I finally got an explanation of when David said, what is man? I get it. Boy, God, you have a high opinion of me. That's amazing. But yet, then they come to a question. Rightly so. These are not stupid people. They say, but wait a second, Lord. Why have we then fasted? And you don't see it. Why have we afflicted our soul? And you won't answer. Why, Father, you just don't take note and notice anything. You simply won't answer my prayer. But if all that, why will you not respond, God? This is, this, this is confusing. It's Gideon saying, well, wait one minute, sir. Mr. Angel, are you telling me that I'm that? Then why? Where are the miracles? Gideon had a right question. If you say I'm that, I'm the smallest, I'm a nobody, I'm a nothing. But, but if you say I'm that, where's the power? Why then am I thus? Perfect question. It should be asked by every single person. If I am a Christian and a child of God, if my sins are forgiven, then explain, Lord, why I'm the tail and not the head. Explain when they passed over me. Explain when the trouble came. It came! I need clarity. It's a good question. We should do what they did. They were perplexed. Why phone? Why you take no knowledge? And then he answers in a nanosecond. He didn't pause, he didn't reflect. He was waiting, provoking the question. He did exactly what God knows to do. I'll tell you what you are. I'll tell you you're sinless. I'll tell you you're my daughter and you're my son. I will tell you that my son died for you. I'll tell you that that blood is the most precious commodity in all eternity, and it covers you. Well, we applaud. Yes, we should. They fell right into my trap. But then, why? He has us exactly where he wants us. It's so beautifully woven that truly we should marvel at the wisdom of our Messiah. Well, he goes, you see, you fast, you find pleasure, you exact all your labors. You fast, but you fast for strife and to debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day, simply to make your voice heard on high. Literally, I mean this, I know I've said it before, we could take a week and a half to explain that. Let's go simply to the obvious. Why do people fast? Most people fast, if not 99.9% .9 of the people, in order to move God's hand. They want a job, I'm going to fast. The house is, you know, in trouble, I'm going to fast. Let's fast. We have a problem, let's fast tomorrow for a day and see if we can push God to answer our prayer. That's why people fast. They fast for themselves. They want something, need something, got to get something resolved or taken away. Let's fast. Let, let's, let's get power so that God answers our prayer and does what we need or want. That's why they fast. <laughs> God calls that, you're fasting for you. How, what kind of a fast is that? Let's see now. I'm going to fast so I can get what I want. Oh, that's really a fast. <laughs> what, do you, what is that? I'm going to sacrifice terribly a hamburger so that I can get the new job. Well, wait a minute. Who's getting the new job? I am. 
So how is that a fast? What do you, that, that's ridiculous in God's mind. It's preposterous. It's the height, height, zenith of hypocrisy that you're fasting to get something. A fast is you're giving something. You're sacrificing for something, not for yourself. That's not a sacrifice. A fast is for God. It's to give God something. It's to go without so that God gets what he wants. Good Lord. It is so patently obvious. And yet, Christians miss it. So God makes it so clear, abundantly kindergarten clear. And he says, you're only fasting for you to resolve a fight you're having with somebody, to rebuke and bind the devil for something. You're fasting for debates and strifes that you're going through. You're fasting for relief from something. You fast for you. You fast to smite with the fist of wickedness. And God says, you shall not fast this day to make your voice heard. How clear can it be? Stop fasting for you. Stop fasting to make your voice heard. Stop fasting trying to manipulate me. It's not going to work. No matter how good you are. Remember how he described them? You're the best thing since sliced bread. But I'm still not going to answer your selfish prayer. You're wonderful. You're forgiven. You're my children. You have favor. You're, you're unbelievable. I'm still not going to answer your prayer. Good Lord, how dumb can we be? Listen, is it such a fast that I have chosen? Is this what I want for a man to afflict his soul? You know what he's saying? I afflicted my kid for you. And now you think you're going to give up a cheeseburger compared to the blood of my son? And you think you've got to afflict yourself? What is wrong with you people? He's like, it, it's mind boggling to him. He's just saying, you can't be, come on now. The blood of the Son of God suffering in agony for us. Oh God, I'm not going to eat till six. I'm just going to drink filtered water with a little sugar and cinnamon in it. And maybe, maybe past two I'll have a piece of bread. And, and God said, what? Well, obviously you're not discerning something, ma'am or sir. Obviously your theology is skewed, whoa, badly. And God is trying to reason with you, you wonderful child of God, that are, bless my soul, but I'm still not going to answer you. Listen, a man to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him. He's saying for you to, you know, walk around, I'm fasting today. I can't watch a movie, I'm fasting till seven. Seven o'clock, get the movie ready, have the chocolate ready, have the marshmallows ready, have the popcorn ready. It's seven, boom, turn it on. And the stuff your cheeks, God is saying, what, what? <laughs> Please reason. Please, because I want to bless you. I want to answer your prayer. I want to open heaven. Watch. Will you call this a fast? Will you say this is an acceptable day to the Lord? Again, he's reasoning. Uh, my son died and you think you got to do all these silly things it's ridiculous and he's telling you it's ridiculous but worse yet let me say it for the millionth time he's also saying i am not gonna answer your prayer how clear why keep continue struggling he won't do it believe me he won't he absolutely will not is not this the fast that i've chosen now you should take the word gospel and write it right here because all it is, if you read Isaiah 61 and Luke 4, we don't have the time to do it, but this is exactly what God is saying now. He's saying, preach the gospel, buddy. This is what I want you to do. Stop doing what I don't want you to do. Stop trying to get manipulate me to get something from me and just obey me and do the purpose of God. Now next week, because I know we don't have time, but next week, you listen, come with a notepad and a pen record it do something because you're going to understand a secret you're going to understand the gospel by the grace of god so clear that i know it will provoke life change i know it because we've seen it countless times why does it work everywhere <laughs> because it's successful listen 
Is not this the fast that I have chosen? My fast that I have chosen. Not what you've chosen. What I've chosen, saith the Lord. To loose the bands of wickedness. To undo the heavy burdens. To let the oppressed go free. And that you break every yoke. It's the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because. It is the purpose of the Holy Spirit. It's the only reason you got saved. I know you may not be comfortable with this, but God didn't get you saved so that you would be saved. God got you saved so you would save others. That's the, why he saved you. That's why he saved you. No other reason, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> he believed you would be the body of Christ. Listen, to unloose the bands of wickedness. You have power to loose and bind. You have power to rebuke in the name of Jesus. You have power to get someone who's sick free. You have power to heal a dog, my God. You have power to raise those people that are in oppression. You have that power. That's the fast I want, he's saying. Listen to this. To bring the poor that are cast out to your house. That means go get them and bring them to church to take those people that are afflicted, that can't bring themselves, that don't know anything, that they resist the blessing. God says, man, bring them to your house. Then that church better be your church and there better be your house. Stop skipping and jumping and read Psalm 92. Plant yourself big, own a church, own a house, own a tribe. Have as much sense as the Jewish nation. Listen to this. And if this ain't church for you, fine. Find one and stop criticizing and jumping. Because at least in the Jewish nation, some girls were going to marry and they got an inheritance. And another guy from the tribe said, wait one minute. Suppose they marry outside of our tribe. They're going to take that inheritance of the land and the waters and the springs and the farms and the vineyards and the vats with them to another tribe. That can't be. Moses, go to God and see what God says. Moses goes to God and God says, man, that man is wise. That's a tribal possession. That stays within the family. They go to the daughters and say, honey, you can't marry just anybody. You got to marry within the family. Otherwise, the inheritance gets dispersed and we lose power. They obeyed and did exactly what they were told. Have enough sense in the New Testament, it's even stronger here. Join a local church, take on its DNA, be a part of the fabric and build. So bring them to your house. When you see the naked, cover him. And do not hide yourself from your own flesh. That is one of the most evangelistic scriptures in the Bible. The fact that when you go to work, you hide the fact that you're a Christian. And you hide from people. Because you, be, you don't want to be obvious. You don't want to be overt. You want to be quiet and polite. Oh yeah, that's really going to work. God says, stop that kind of living where you're under disguise, you know, you're, you're, you're wearing some hidden clothing and you're not proud and bold to be a Christian. Stop doing that. Stop hiding. Make it up front and center. I am a Christian. And by the way, you're going to see that when you see the enormous blessing on my life. Maybe if you were bold, God would give you a bold blessing rather than being quiet about it and ashamed of Jesus Christ. Watch this. Once you obey the gospel, and we, there's not enough time to give you all of the connections. They're by the hundreds that this is the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he is saying. Study this yourself. Go home and read 58. It takes all of three minutes. Ask God to talk to you. You need to hear this truth from the Lord himself. Say, God, explain this to me. I'm a wonderful Christian. You're not answering my prayers. Why? He's going to say, this is why. Because you're doing church the way you want to do it instead of doing it for my purpose and the reason my son died, to save people all over the world. It's the souls. Invest yourself in saving the people out of the hospitals and the fires of life. And today, you see success that I was humbled, crying. My God, what have you done, Lord Jesus? This young pup, what have you done? For people who will only give themselves to the Lord. Listen to this. 
Once you obey the gospel, we'll end here. Then, underline the word then, not until then. No way, no how, I will not answer your prayer. But when you do this, then your light shall break forth like the morning. What he's saying is instantaneously I will bless you. It's not a process, it's an opening up of heaven and giving you my favor. It happens in a nano instant second. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Then your health shall spring forth speedily. Then righteousness shall go before you and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard, your rear reward. My God! When is the then gonna come in your life? Why is it that we see certain people struggle so mightily and others, well, what the heck is that? A young minister down south, not seeing fruitfulness, barren, so to speak, virtually in every area of his life. Financial pressures, family pressures, ministry zero, gave himself over to understanding this truth. It was explained to him, it was taught. You're going about it and your enemy, according to Haggai, is God. Your, your business that you're trying so hard for, the person who's preventing the prosperity is the Lord. You, 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 stop, just do what you're told. Do, go to God and say, I'm gonna do what you said and I'm coming back a month from now and seeing if you're true to your word. Talk to God that way. He doesn't get rattled. He'll take it pretty good. He'll probably say, thank God you're finally gonna try to believe me. You're finally gonna have enough faith to obey and not destroy my people. Can you imagine the distance between, please, hear this. Hear this. What is the distance between criticizing God's people, whether justified or not, you're supposed to cover them. How dare you criticize God's people? And then on the other hand, there's someone who's giving his life to save them and sacrificing, picking them up in the car even though they live in the Bronx or in Tampa, praying with them at three in the morning because they're, they're on the side of the world, getting so busy with lighthouses that you have to get staff to help you to have the meetings. What, what dichotomy, what, what, what dip north, south pole greater? On one hand, you're trying to kill people. and the other hand, you're obeying God that he died for these people. You don't think there's a difference in the amount of blessing? Come on, guys. Think straight, please. Because I'm fairly fed up. I tell you this now almost every week. To see people that can move the hand of God so readily, so easily. They have favor like you want to stand next to them. Something wonderful is going to happen. And then there's those, those other people that everything goes wrong, everything is a pressure, everything is an argument, everything is a strife, everything is a discontent, nothing really happens to their satisfaction, they're always compromising, always falling short, always murmuring, always complaining, and man, what a difference! Please read this chapter when you go home. And I give you now an obvious disqualifier, an obvious, you know, I don't want to call it an apology. I know that this message may resonate to some in a borderline offensive way. I hope and pray it doesn't. I know it's not the kindest, cheeriest, fun, happy message. I understand that. But sometimes you got to take the medicine and it's bitter in order so that the healing comes and newness of life springs forth. Because we see so many testimonies all over the world, it spans cultures, tongues, races, norms. God is not a respecter, so he moves one way and it's apparent and successful. And yet another, this clawing to try to get a blessing to the point you rip your nails off and your bones bleed. This chapter, by the time we finish in another week or two, we'll open up heaven for you. It's guaranteed. You'll see change. You'll see blessings. 
So go through the hard time. There's not a lot more critical stuff coming, maybe another 15, 20 minutes next week or the week after of a little bit more tough teaching. But then when heaven's open, I think you're going to bring a rose to church and throw it at the foot of the cross. I think you're going to bring your heart to Jesus and go and kiss that cross there. I think you're going to say thank you on your knees. I think you're going to shout, scream and yell and celebrate when all of a sudden you see, you mean to tell me I could have had this all along? Yeah, yeah you could have, but you're about to get it in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you.